Hello, and today we're going to be taking a look at the 9500 GT. It came out back in 2008 at a price point of about $90, but now it was for about $20 on eBay. And I'm going to be overclocking it as far as possible to see if it can still hold up. So, stick around to find out if it's still worth the money and if you should buy one. To set the stage, this card came out 15 years ago as part of the GeForce 9 series. It was a mid-range card, and with a sub $100 price tag, it was a popular choice. It competed against ATI's Radeon 4000 series, and I wouldn't say there's a clear winner, but Nvidia did have the fastest GPU. But my card isn't in the best condition, so we're gonna have to take it apart first. This is the 9500 GT. I got it in a lot of 10 graphics cards that I paid $30 for, so it only cost me about $3. But this card's in a pretty rough condition. It is disgusting inside and out, and it even still has the plastic wrap on it. So before we get into overclocking it, I'm gonna take it apart and replace the paste. This card, along with the rest of the GeForce 9 series, was based on an improved version of the Tesla architecture using the 65 nanometer process. The 9500 GT in particular ship with the G96 processor that came with 32 shading units, 16 texture mapping units, and 8 render output units. But there were two different versions of this card, one with a half gig of VRAM and the other one with a full gig with slightly different clock speeds. Ours is by EVGA and has 1 gigabyte of DDR2 memory clocked at 800 megahertz, a core clock of 550 megahertz, and a shader clock of 1350 megahertz. But those are the stock settings and I'm gonna push them as far as possible. And there's the heatsink off. I don't know why the previous owner left on the plastic wrap, but it is shredded and absolutely falling to bits. Thank God that's finally off. Since the 9500 GT is so old, it lacks a lot of modern features. It was made with PCIe 2.0 in mind, but more importantly, only supports up to DirectX 10. I mean, it is full support, but it means we're not going to be able to run a lot of games. On the bright side, at least it doesn't require additional power cables. It has a TDP of only 50 watts and gets all its power through the PCIe lane, so it's more or less plug and play. And there's the heatsink. Yeah, it is It is pretty dirty. I'm, I'm going to go run this under some water and clean it up. Now, before I overclock the card, I did some research to find out what I should be able to achieve. And I stumbled across this post that stated that his 9500 GT was reaching 240 degrees Celsius. That's 464 degrees Fahrenheit. And with a 50 watt TDP and active cooler, I'm stuck wondering what the heck happened to this guy's card and how it didn't thermal throttle. We're going to be using some good old MX4 thermal paste. I'm not sure if it's the best stuff, but the card isn't very powerful, so it doesn't matter. Also, while taking the card apart, I noticed a connection that I've never seen before. Well, it turns out that it was used for SPDIF pass-through, which was used for transferring audio data on a multiple speaker setup or something to that effect. I don't know if this is something that GPU manufacturers still use, but it piqued my interest. Well, this is interesting. You see that little bit right there? You have to screw the screw onto the pin from the heatsink. I've never seen such a goofy setup. Now, taking apart this card wasn't fun. It was very dirty, and I regret not having gloves to wear. But eventually, I was able to get it all cleaned up and was ready for some overclock. Clocking. All right, and the card's all back together. Let's throw it in the test system. The test system we'll be using has an i3-4130, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and Windows 7 running on an unbranded SSD. For overclocking, I used NVIDIA Inspector, since it gives you more control than most of the softwares like MSI Afterburner. But I wasn't able to push it as far as I wanted to, and only achieved 91 megahertz on the core, 110 on the memory, and 123 on the shaders. I compared it to what other people got, and it seemed that they were able to overclock the cards much further. I don't know why this is the case, but I'll chalk it up to the rough condition I got my card in. But before we get into the results, consider subscribing or leaving a like, because as you'll soon find out, testing this card was mental torture. Initially, it seemed like things were going well. I started in CSGO in 720p with the low settings where the FPS hovered between 30 and 40. Given the sub 1080p resolution, it's not the best performance, but it is kind of impressive when you consider the card's age and that CSGO has gradually gotten harder to run. And I would say it was a playable experience. The lower resolution will probably affect long distance firefights, but the card was stable and didn't run into many issues. So I decided to run some Black Ops 2 on the system, and this is where the problem started. For lack of a better term, the 9500 GT went to war with my capture card and I had to record it on my phone. But the performance was good and in 720p with the low settings got an average frame rate of 40. Also I wanted to mention that these NPCs are pretty stupid. They are just running at tanks with an AK and this went about as well for them as you would expect. So I hopped into the more peaceful world of Minecraft. I played the latest release in 1080p with a render distance of 8 chunks and the low settings got an average frame rate of 65. You'd think that's good but the performance took a big hit when having to load in new chunks. However that's like 
likely the CPU's fault since it spiked to 100% when rendering new ones. But I mean, it still ran well, so I upped the ante and tried running some GTA 5. This benchmark was painful. It crashed so many times, and for this test, I had to revert to the default clock speeds. I ran the game in a resolution of 800 by 600, and it managed to get an average frame rate of 22. Overall, it wasn't really playable, partially due to the low frame rate and partially due to its tendency to crash. But it was still able to technically run, and you have to appreciate just how well optimized the game is, especially with such an old GPU. Next, I hopped into a more realistic use case for this card and played some Fallout New Vegas. This game came out two years after the 9500 GT did, and many people likely paired the two together. For some reason, it automatically set the graphics to high, but this caused the game to immediately crash. I ended up running it in 720p with the low settings and it got an average frame rate of 60 FPS. The GPU utilization was also only around 70%, so there was some performance left on the table, and you could easily increase the resolution in the graphics settings. Afterwards, I played some Borderlands 2 in 720p with the low settings, got an average frame rate of 32 FPS. It was playable, but it did slow down in some instances, especially when having to render the caustic effects of an elemental weapon. But it still mostly ran well, and you can definitely pull it off with this card. Dishonored was a similar experience as well, and in 720p with the low settings got an average frame rate of 43 FPS. The game came out 4 years after the 9500 GT did, but still provided a smooth experience. The minimum system requirements do cite a GTX 460, but it ran just fine. I think having a full gigabyte of VRAM was the saving grace for this card, and if I was testing the half gig version, performance would probably be a lot worse. And the last game I tested was Left 4 Dead 2. I was actually able to crank the resolution up to 1080p for this one, and with the low settings got an average frame rate of 46. However, this game came out only one year after the GPU in question did, which makes the performance seem kind of lackluster. I mean, it's not bad, but if my one-year-old mid-range graphics card was only pulling 40-something FPS with the low settings, I'd be disappointed. In other news, I also tried running Fortnite, but it threw a DirectX error, which I found kind of odd since I was able to run the game with other 9 series graphics cards like the 9800 GTX Plus. Maybe they had an update or something, and that's what the issue is, but it might also be due to my card's general instability. Earlier I said that using this card was a pretty painful experience, and essentially my card was on its deathbed and would crash whether it was overclocked or not. This wouldn't have been that bad, but there was no correlation between the card settings, computer environment, or DirectX level, and its in-game instability. On average, the card would crash about 3 or 4 times during every test, each time requiring a full system reset. I've never had a card act up so badly, but that's not why I can't recommend it. I mean, at this point it's pretty obvious that the performance isn't great, even in older games, and it truly is e-waste. If you're a collector, I guess it'd be a nice card to have, but using it in your daily driver system is probably a bad idea. And for the same price, you can get a Quadro K600 or K620 on eBay, and those offer much better performance and actually support modern graphics APIs. I give the 9500 GT a 3 out of 10 in terms of capabilities, and my card specifically a 0 out of 10 because of how horrible the experience was. Either way, I hope you enjoyed the video. Consider leaving a like or subscribing because it genuinely helps me out. If you want to join the community, there's a link to the official Jane Knight Discord server in the description, alongside a few donation methods that directly support the channel. If you have any questions or related comments, then leave them below and I'll be sure to respond to them. That's about it. Have a great day. Bye.